a patient feels bad enough that they come into our emergency room, crawl up on a gurney and put themselves at our mercy because they feel that bad, that we owe it to them to make them prove why they don't have sepsis instead of why they do. Every year, 258,000 Americans die of a disease that many people have never heard of. Back in August 2014, um, I was working at the Choctaw Library. I love people and um, I love books. And it was after I got home, I started to feel sick. I thought maybe it's the flu. But when I woke up the next morning, I realized I felt a lot worse. She continued to have fever and chills, um, a very sore throat. She also was very agitated and couldn't fall asleep. I had never felt that achy before. And I made the comment to him, I said, I feel like I got run over by a Mack truck. And Jay suggested, you know, you don't get sick. I'm kind of concerned. Let's go to the emergency room and get you checked out. And when we were seen by the doctor. He decided that it must be a virus. The doctor told us it'll probably get worse before it gets better. And he prescribed some cough syrup with codeine. The symptoms of sepsis mimic quite a few other illnesses, such as the flu. When you come to seek help, frequently the patients are sent away and said, you know, it's a viral illness or give it 24 hours or come back in two days and if you don't feel better. Unfortunately, with sepsis, it progresses very quickly and 48 hours is too long to seek treatment. We came home and I took the medication and I still couldn't sleep. I just kind of laid around all day again. I was in a lot of pain, joint pain, muscle pain, I understand what it means when you feel like you're dying. It is common that a person who has developed severe sepsis feels perhaps the worst that they have ever felt, like having the flu on steroids. And then vomiting started. And sometime during the night I got up because I had diarrhea. So I ended up falling asleep or passing out, I'm not sure what, on the bathroom floor. But once I woke up, then I could even muster up the strength to raise my voice and to holler for him. We needed to go back to the emergency room. If you're at home and you think your loved one has an infection and that they might have sepsis, it's important that you dial 911 and you tell the operator, I think they have sepsis and I need to get them to the emergency room. Sepsis is an emergency, plain and simple. It was a 32 hour time difference from the first time I was at the emergency room to the second time I went to the emergency room. Every hour sepsis goes untreated, the mortality rate climbs. Um, as soon as they started taking my vitals, they realized something was really wrong. I, my, my heart rate was up. I started to get shooting pains in my arms. It was absolutely the worst pain I'd ever been in. She wasn't producing any urine. They thought it could possibly be a urinary tract infection could be causing the high heart rate and the low blood pressure. And they started giving me fluids and they started me on a broad spectrum antibiotic. Antibiotics must be given as soon as we can humanly give them when we suspect sepsis. Hesitating leads to death in many cases but you need to get the results of your blood cultures so that you can narrow those antibiotics as soon as possible. So the doctor said that they would need to take her to the ICU. That's where it starts to get a blur. I mean, everything was happening so quick and so they were really concerned because my kidneys weren't functioning. The doctor came in and just told us that, you know, obviously she was sick, she was septic. And they started to explain about sepsis and septic shock. That's the first we heard anything about it. Nearly half of Americans have never heard the word sepsis. Many people have never heard of sepsis because, frankly, their doctors never use the term. Even on the death certificate, it most frequently does not say sepsis. Sepsis is the way that infections kill, and no one knows. There are nearly 1.6 million cases of sepsis each year. And of these cases, 20% of them die. Sepsis is the body's overwhelming and potentially life-threatening response to an infection, which can lead to tissue damage, organ failure, and death. I think it's reasonably common that people who hear that their loved one is septic do become worried that they could get sepsis themselves. Sepsis is not contagious. It's your individual response to an infection. There are different stages to sepsis, and there are SIRS, sepsis, severe sepsis, and then ultimately septic shock.
SIRS is a systemic inflammatory response syndrome. SIRS is a normal immune response. It's what would be expected when you have an infection or a bacteria or virus enter your body. If SIRS progresses and the, your body is unable to fight that bacteria or virus or infection off on its own, it'll develop into sepsis. That's the next stage. Some of the symptoms are problems breathing, fast heart rate, high temperature or chills, Extreme pain, some people refer to it as the worst pain they've ever felt. Pale or discolored skin, dizzy or lightheaded, difficult to rouse or confused. When you have a combination of some of these symptoms and not just one single, that is sepsis and that's the next stage. When you have sepsis and you have one or more organs that are not functioning properly, that equals severe sepsis. When you have severe sepsis and you have low blood pressure that's not responding to IV fluids, now you have septic shock. But in the beginning, it's difficult to diagnose but easy to treat. But in the course of time, it becomes easy to recognize but difficult to treat. Severe sepsis is the number one killer of people in hospitals in the United States. Most people believe that infections that lead to sepsis were acquired in the hospital. But in fact, 80% of the infections that lead to sepsis are acquired in the community. So there are different types of infections that can lead to sepsis. Um, they're parasitic, bacterial, fungal, or viral. It can happen um, from any type of infection. It could be C. diff, pneumonia, urinary tract infections, MRSA. It could be as common as an ear infection or a strep throat or, you know, just a cut. Everyday things can trigger sepsis. Um, it's, it's very random. It's something that can happen to anybody at any time. Unfortunately, there is no single definitive test for sepsis, but there are some commonly used tests that may indicate sepsis. They include lactic acid tests, which indicate that your body is attempting to function without oxygen. Blood cultures can indicate that there's an infection and what kind of infection it is. Procalcitonin or PCT tests measure PCT hormone levels. Elevated levels of PCT may indicate a bacterial infection along with an extreme overreaction of the immune system. Those most vulnerable to sepsis are the very young, the very old, and those with chronic conditions. There are some chronic diseases that make people more vulnerable to developing sepsis. The most common are COPD and diabetes. But there are others such as multiple sclerosis, HIV, cirrhosis, and cancer. When I started researching sepsis, septic shock, and all the things associated with it, and it came to my realization that my wife was in an all-out war on sepsis. She was fighting for her life, but no one mentioned the fact that there was a very good chance my wife would be passing in the next 24 to 48 hours or anything like that. I never realized then that she was probably not gonna make it. Sepsis kills a person every two minutes in the United States. Sometime that night, um, things got really worse and I needed to um, be put on a ventilator. Her lungs were failing, her blood pressure was dropping, they were putting her on vasopressors. Her limbs, hands and feet were turning a gray, bluish gray, which is the first signs of tissue death. In septic shock cases, we have to give vasopressor agents, which are drugs that constrict the blood vessels just to keep the blood pressure up, but that constriction also results in reduced blood flow to organs and tissues that need oxygen in order to survive. So the combination of capillary clotting and vasopressor often results in death of fingers, toes, tips of noses, ears, uh, so that those need to be amputated in order for the patient to survive. It's almost surreal at times because, again, she's not like a cancer patient that had months or even years. Um, we had minutes and hours, and she deteriorated so rapidly, and that's what people need to understand is how quickly you can go from healthy to on your deathbed. In our hospital, the same way that you'll hear on the PA system, code blue for someone whose heart has stopped, you'll also hear code sepsis ICU, code 
code sepsis, ICU. Getting the blood cultures drawn and antibiotics into patients within an hour is not common, but we found it to be extremely effective in helping our patients, and we've reduced our mortality rates from sepsis by 50%. Every hospital should have a code sepsis team. It's a way to have like a blueprint of how we're going to treat septic patients. The septic shock was so bad that they gave me a 5% chance of surviving. If sepsis was treated as a medical emergency, many more patients could be saved. Upwards of 200,000 patients per year here in the U.S. When the doctor came in on Tuesday, August 12th, he said, it's time for you and your family to prepare and say final goodbyes. At the end of the conversation, I had said, if you don't feel like you can fight anymore, you just need to let me know. She immediately opened her eyes up and gave me the dirtiest look that I've ever seen. And I knew right then that we were still in the fight. Over the next seven to 10 days, her condition would gradually improve. And after about 10 days, we realized that she was gonna make it, but the repercussions were gonna be catastrophic. Her limbs were literally dying in front of my eyes and there's nothing that I or anybody could do about it. At that point, I understood and I knew that they were gonna to need to be amputated. I more or less just wanted to get it over with. Um, I was tired of looking at them. They were useless and I was very sensitive about other people seeing them, so I tried to keep them hidden so people wouldn't see them. On average, over 30 people a day undergo a sepsis-associated amputation in the United States. As a husband and a protector, there's probably no worse feeling than watching your wife suffer and there's nothing that you can do and knowing that after she fought so hard to beat this illness when she was given very little chance, she's now gonna have to spend the rest of her life as a quadruple amputee. So yes, it was very devastating. There's depression, there is fear, anxiety. These are all things that some sepsis survivors are reporting to have following their first episode. Some patients even suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder. I was in rehab and I looked at him and I told him, I said, I don't expect you to stay with me. I said, this is not what you signed up for. I said, I feel like this has ruined my life. And the only thing worse than this is ruining two lives. This was my problem. This happened to me. And he was like, no, this, this happened to us. This, it's us. And he's like, I'm not, I'm not going anywhere. So that was a huge burden off of me. He's really been my rock. Life after sepsis can be tough for anyone who gets it. Uh, a substantial number are left with permanent impairment. But just the way she's handled the whole situation and been willing to help other people, mentor other amputees, and get involved in raising an awareness of sepsis. It's important to me that people understand sepsis I don't want my wife to have lost her hands and feet in vain. You need to know the symptoms and know what to do right away. It can spread so quickly. You've got to advocate for your care and for the care of your loved ones because that can make all the difference. Excellent sepsis care is absolutely achievable in the tiniest of hospitals in the most rural and isolated of locations. Because, as we say, the mainstays of treatment are early antibiotics and fluids. They nip the sepsis in a bud. They're able to keep people at home. Some doctors are reluctant to initiate antibiotics because of this possibility of resistance. In the case of sepsis, unfortunately, that's dangerous. There is no alternative. If you have a septic patient, that patient has to have antibiotics being administered to them. If I had had you know, a blood test and they could have given me some antibiotics, then this would not have happened. And this could have been prevented. Another way to avoid the dangers of sepsis is to prevent infections from taking hold in the first place. This can be accomplished by making sure to keep up to date on all your vaccinations. Make sure to clean and treat any open wounds. Complete all prescribed courses of antibiotics. And practice good hygiene, including thorough hand washing. All great medicine is a partnership between patients and their physician. If we can get doctors and nurses and lay people themselves educated about how to recognize sepsis and how to treat it early and aggressively, we'll have a tremendously positive impact on the outcomes from sepsis. There is hope. 
through education, the general public, and for healthcare providers, we can certainly improve outcomes and save lives. 1 1,000, 2 1,000, 3 1,000, 3 seconds. Every 3 seconds, someone in the world dies of sepsis. But in the 9.58 seconds it takes Usain Bolt to run 100 meters, three people in the world have died of sepsis. I don't know about you, but that's ridiculous to me.